Ag Lunch Lecture Series offers you the opportunity to get to know creative thinkers and creative visionaries through engaging dialogues and demonstrations. Each month, a different speaker will share their passion and creativity with us and connect our campus and the communities we serve through the arts. The Brown Bag Lunch Lecture Series is made possible in part through funding from the Daniel Foundation Culture and Community Assets Grant. Through this project, Talladega College aims to enhance access to its collections of art and cultural artifacts, increase educational outreach opportunities, and deepen the college's impact on our community. The event is also made possible by the resources of Talladega College. I hope you'll join us next month on October the 5th for our next lecture with Salam Green. And that information is on the back of your programs that are on the table. Uh, we'll also have some evalu evaluation forms at the end of the event. We hope that you will take a moment to complete those because your feedback will help us to improve future programming at the Harvey Museum. I would, uh, at this time, I'd like to recognize someone in our audience, our, vice, our executive vice president and provost, um, Dr. Barbara Johnson is standing in the back. Thank you for being here today, Dr. Johnson. And at this time, I will introduce our speaker today. Dr. Linda Holloway is a story activist, author, counselor, and professor, and a faithful servant leader who lives by the motto, always willing to serve. She served over 27 years in the United States Army Medical Army Reserves Medical Service Corps, completing four combat tours and retiring as a colonel. She has served in higher education for nearly three decades and published numerous articles in her field. Through her platform, Women Without Limitations, Dr. Holloway advocates for women to discover, embrace, and live out their ordained destiny in life. She will speak today about black hair, getting to the roots, which draws, which draws upon the story in her children's book, award-winning children's book, I Love My Happy Hair. Dr. Holloway is a native of Mound Bayou, Mississippi, which we've been talking about, where she learned many pearls of life growing up on a farm with her parents, Eugene and Willie Lou B. Holloway, and her six sisters and two brothers. Please welcome Dr. Holloway. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm really excited to be here, and I bring you greetings from Alabama State University, where we say every day is a great day to be a hunter. I'm really pleased to be on Talladega College campus, and I'm looking forward to just having an informal kind of conversation about black hair. It is something that has intrigued people for years, and so we hope to dispel a lot of myths and walk away with a great deal of understanding. I'm going to tell you how this all got started. In the world of academia, you get an opportunity to write. And so I began to write about those things that were of interest to me. And so these are the current books that I have published already. And you can see them also on the table. But these were initially, these were articles. These were articles that I had written about. For example, I wrote about black hair in the marketplace. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. I also wrote about uh, blacks in counseling, why they rather go see their uh, pastor, rather go to seek professional counseling. I also wrote about sickle cell. And I wrote about sickle cell because I have a really good friend who suffers from sickle cell. And sickle cell is one of those illness that is very common in the black community, but it does not get a lot of, uh, I guess you can say a lot of um, no publicity, exactly. And believe it or not, September is Sickle Cell Awareness Month. And most people do not know that. And June 19 is National Sickle Cell Day. 
but it has gotten a lot more publicity and a lot of more research is being done in that area. So that's what that book is about. It's a little girl who talks about that. Also wrote about rape. Rape is one of those things that oftentimes in the black community is not talked about. We will talk about sexual assault. It's a good touch, bad touch. And I know that sounds like a very strong word for young children, but we have to call it for what it is. And black women historically, even during slavery, had to experience being raped. And so I wanted to be able to say that out loud, be able to talk to young children about that. About that. And then um, Little Miss Linda speaks out about diversity. Uh, oftentimes when people think of diversity, they only think of race. This particular book deal with colorism. As she mentioned, I have six sisters and two brothers, and we are all of different shades, and we do have the same parents. And so oftentimes people will make difference between the shade or the hue of a black person, whether better or good. So this book actually talks about that. So I kind of wanted to give you a little background of how I got started and what really went into this and what led me to that next. One of the things I often tell people when they're writing, because a lot of people say, hey, I want to publish a book, I want to write something. I, you can start small, you can write for a newspaper article, you can write it for a magazine. But I said, write about the things that you love. But a lot of times people like to write about those things that are trending things that they think that are popular. But if you are passionate about it, and it's something that you really, truly like, then guess what? You're the best person that can tell, what, tell that story. So believe it or not, if you write about those things that you love, that you're passionate about, you will get other people just as excited. Next. So on this particular slide, a lot of things, uh, <clears throat> when I do presentation, I often do them like I teach my class. So I often like to have videos. And so what I want to talk about is there's a history when it comes to black hair. Black hair just didn't show up when they arrived in 1619 on the board. Black people were doing hair and black hair had a message. Oftentimes black women would wear their hair in such a style that let them know that they were single or that they were married or they will wear the mohawk to let them know that they had gone off to war. So there were different things about black hair. But when they arrived, one of the things when I was doing the research was a young man wrote a book and it really inspired me. It's called 400 Years Without a Comb. Now oftentimes when we think about the slave ship, we don't necessarily think about these people were not able to comb their hair. You said, well, out of all the things, why would we think about that? Well, because hair was important, it told the story. And a lot of people knew back in the day when they called it cornrow, this was like a map so that they could become free. And so they would do this with their hair. A lot of people, when they came on the ship, they had different fruits, they had different things that they would bring. And guess what? They would actually put an okra seed, watermelon seed in their hair. And that's how they were able to transport a lot of these things. So there's a lot of different things about people hair. And no, Bulgaric did not start the cornrow. So we have to understand the history behind black people hair. So this is a short video, so hopefully it'll come up. If you can click on the YouTube, see if it'll... Okay. Oh, it won't. We got sound. Skip, yeah.
I was wondering if they knew about the Jerry <laughs> Care. All right, thank you guys. Um, as you probably I use a lot of clips in my class, but it, it actually allows the students to, you know, just kind of think about things. It gives them the history of things. I also say, is there anything that resonates with you? Is there anything that you didn't understand? And one of the things that often stands out to them is in the beginning, if you notice, there was the grease and there was, and they had to use like literally oil from tars to actually press their hair because it was really important. So a lot of times what the slaves would do on Sunday when they gathered and they had the time off was this when they would come and they would do their hair and they would share stories. And I remember as a child getting my hair done, being on the stool, and my mom, there was a very intimate time for us to talk about different things, what I was into, not into. And uh, so it's a very uh, moment so we get to talk about that. And as young men, oftentimes, that, you know, parents would say, well, who did your hair? Like if you had your, if you left and your hair was done in a certain way, because they wanted to know what woman had been in your hair. There was a lot of myths around if a woman got in your hair and what that would do. And there's a lot of myths around black hair, even to the point that when you would get your hair combed, leaving your hair in the comb, my mother would not allow you to like take your hair out of the comb 
and just lay it somewhere because she said the birds could get it or you can have headaches or people could do a lot of different things with your hair. And if they, you know, of course they have kind of like demonized voodoo, hoodoo and all of that. So a lot of there was a lot of stories around black people in their hair. So they really treasure their hair. So it gives you the opportunity to see that. When you see the women that are kind of tying their hair, because in Louisiana, they actually passed a law because black women were wearing their hair in such fashionable styles that the white men liked it. So they said, look, you guys got to cover your hair. But guess what? That made them like them even more. Because you know, when black folks do things, we do it what? In excellence. So they had all these colorful scarves that they would actually do and cover their hair. So it really didn't help out a whole lot. So that's what you see going in that particular uh, illustration. Um, make fun. It's probably, I won't go through all the videos I kind of tell you about them. This is hair tail. Um, sometimes I have students to tell about their first story about their hair tail. And this is, um, Tracy Ross did this one. Uh, I want to say so. This is just a trailer. So um, let's see if we can bring that up for a minute, so you can just kind of get an idea. And the rest of them, I'll talk through them. Oh no, this. I just kind of told. I think Tracy does a magnificent job or just re-inviting us into the stories and the hair trauma and that people had, even with Oprah being on the network. And she talks about her story. So one of the things that you want to get people to do is to tell their hair story. And sometimes they'll tell it for the first time and sometimes they never really thought about they actually had a hair story and how their hair evolved. So in the article I wrote, I actually talk about my own hair story and how I came from, you know, getting my hair pressed. I was not able to get my hair perm when I was growing up because my mother said, no, you're not going to put those chemicals in your hair. And she would just press my hair. And so when I got to college at Alcorn State University, I did what? I got a perm. And from there, I began to perm my hair. But when I joined ROTC, I realized that my hair goes back what? To its natural state. And during the time that I was doing ROTC, a lot of times people talk about black people can't swim, right? So when a thing happened in Montgomery, we see this black guy and he's swimming, we like champion him. But there's a history as to why black people can't swim. 
But there's also also when you pay a lot of money for your hair and you don't want to get your hair wet and you're diving because now you understand that there's a lot of things that go into getting my hair. I know that people say, I woke up like this. Well, I wanted to have a hairstyle that I literally could wake up like this and I could do the training that I needed to do, whether I was in the rain or whatever I was doing. So I began to wear my hair like this. And so that became my mantra, but I never really realized that I had a hair story. And that was allowed me to take my cap on, to take it off, and to do all kinds of things when I was in the military. So I get students to really start to think about, or the audience to think about, what is your own hair story? What is your own trauma around your hair? Because sometimes people hair the way it is because they might have an illness, medication they might be taking, uh, there are people who really wear, uh, as you can see, the various styles, but they actually have what I call a nice texture hair. I don't say I try to avoid good and bad because that allows me to say, okay, if this person got good hair and my hair is not like this, does that mean that I have bad hair? I think we all have different texture of hair. And so they became the protective styles that people will wear. Or just sometimes that women decide, I may not want to fix my hair today. I had a friend who was in journalism and she told me, she said, sometimes I would get a wig because you got to be perfect every day. You got to get in front of. So I had, that was my go-to. It wasn't necessarily that I didn't want to have my hair, but she said, next time I get a job, I'm going to negotiate where they can give me grooming service. And I was like, oh, snap. And she was like, everybody else gets it. And so I can look the way I look, I'm supposed to look on TV every day. Okay, next, I probably won't play this one. This is a young girl, she's in actually in Nashville, Tennessee. She has real big hair and she goes to school and they actually tease her. And so her mother has her to do these affirmations and she gets online and she basically just talks about, you know, how she celebrates her hair and she likes her hair. So she's actually being bullied about her hair. Next slide, please. Yeah. This is a young lady who actually talks about, uh, because oftentimes people say, well, it's just hair, it's no big deal. But if it's just hair, then why do you tease me about my hair? Why has hair kept people from getting the type of job that they need? So then you see where this young lady was discriminated against. And it's a very painful thing because you didn't hire me because you didn't like the way my hair was. Because we talk about assimilation and acculturation, so being able to assimilate into a society, so that's why black people begin to wear their hair straight, if they want it straighter so they can blend in and be a part of a culture that will be socially acceptable, particularly in the days when there were movies and things like that, if you wanted to be on the movie. So when Cicely Tyson wore her hair in braids or somebody wore their hair different, it was like, that's not going to work. And so you, you started to see people lose their job or they couldn't, they wouldn't get a job. Next slide, please. <laughs> that's okay. I think it gets into the, uh, at this point, it kind of gets into what the story is about, because what I really wanted to do is show that there's a crown law, and most of you probably have heard of the crown law, but the crown law really stands for creating a um, respectable, open place for natural hair, a workplace for natural hair. And so this law was passed in the state of California, and then it began to pass in other states. So I also want people to know that as an African-American, as a black person, oftentimes we have to fight from the top of our head to the sole of our feet just to let the world know who we are. So I don't know of any other race of ethnic group that has to have a law to say, you can wear your hair the way your hair grows on your head. So one of the things that I do is I, uh, as I was doing these particular articles, they were for adults. But what I really began to think about as I began to read the stories, and sometimes I'm weeping with them, like when I hear about what people have gone through, even the young lady who has the 
um, a patient and her hair has come out and she's talking about they will know that I'm black and I'm looking like Susan, they already know you're black, but she's known, she doesn't understand. So that's part of, of her identity. So I said, how can I reach younger children? And so that began my dialogue with having the children book. So one of the things I do when I go out into the school is really tell children to love their hair the way their hair grows out of their head. Because that's what God has blessed you with. You can go to the next slide. This is in California where they're actually signing the uh, law. So I do the drop, stop, and read kind of thing. And the next slide is just pictures from the uh, book. And the book is about a little girl who really does not like her hair. She looks at everybody else's hair. Next slide. She looks at everybody else's hair. Next slide. And she likes their hair. And you already know, she grows up in Mount Bayou, Mississippi, a town founded by two former slaves in 18, <laughs> 1887. And so, and she's outside playing, doing her thing. Yes, I talk about Mount Bayou a lot, like I was saying, because it's a historically black town that was found by two former enslaved individuals. Next slide. And so she looks around, next slide at her sisters and everybody kind of tease her uh, about her particular hair and next one and she cries of course when she gets her hair combed next one her mother used blue magic grease so i actually my sister told me good luck with finding blue magic grease but guess what i have some blue magic grease walmart here blue magic grease and um so when i deal with the students i actually have a whole display of hot combs, straightening, just everything that they can identify. Next slide, please. So she basically tells her mother that she wished she had hair like everybody else. And God must not have liked her. That's why he gave her that hair. Next slide. Her mother comforts her and tell her that, you know, she has good hair and that, you know, hair is hair that is washed, that's clean, and all of that wonderful stuff. Next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide. So this is her mother telling her how gorgeous her hair is. Next slide. And basically good hair is hair that is washed and clean. Next slide. And she, but one of the things she tells her is she said, every morning when you get up, I want you to look in the mirror and I want you to say mirror, mirror on the wall. I have the prettiest hair of them all. And so she begins to say this mantra every morning. So when I'm out with kids, I, they really enjoy it. I have a mirror and I go around and they get to say mirror, mirror on the wall. I have the prettiest hair of them all because I tell them to do it with style and class. So they do all the wonderful, great stuff. Next slide, please. So she began to tell her mom, she said, and her mom is really excited because she's finally started to like her hair. And she says, mom, I have happy hair. So her mother says to a little Miss Linda, what's happy hair? Next slide, please. And little Miss Linda tells her happy hair is hair that comes from queens and kings of Africa that you can wear it in all kinds of ways. Next slide, please. She said you can wear it kinky, straight, ponytails, cornrows, uh, locks. You can do it in all those kind of ways. I have redone my book and I took dread out because in the history when black people came over, their hair was made into their head. They said, oh, look at the dread in hair. So I don't say that. I say use the word locks. But I know people still use the term dreadlocks because of the negative connotation whether we took it out. Uh, so she just talks about all the different ways that you can wear your hair. Sometimes when people hear the word kinky or nappy, they feel like that's bad. But we kept that in there because that's good. That's just the different types of hair. Next slide, please. Next slide. So from that day forward, little Miss Linda really liked her hair. And she created a song called the Happy Hair Song. And the Happy Hair Song, I am not a singer, but the children helps me out. But the Happy Hair Song goes like this. Now I want some participation. So uh, for those of you who can stand up, stand up. For those of you who feel comfortable seeing, you can keep your seat. Okay, on your feet. I saw military. Right? <laughs> if you, I'm gonna say it, and you just repeat after me. 
If you love your happy hair, clap your hands. If you love your happy hair, snap your fingers. If you love your happy hair, shake your head from side to side. If you love your happy hair, stomp your feet. If you love your happy hair, let me see you do your favorite dance. Come on, everybody. Let me see you do your favorite dance. I know Talladega got a dance. Come on now. <laughs> if you love your happy hair, shout out loud with your fists in the air. I love my happy hair. Let's do it again. Snap your fingers. Clap your hands. Stop your feet. Shout out loud. I love my happy hair. Good job. You guys are pretty good. Woo so, next. Um, I will tell you my first book I had, Charlie Brown. So the kids would always look at me like, uh, I don't know what that is. So I took that out. <laughs> so that's one thing about writing. You get out there, you have a mindset, and the children will teach you. So I've learned a lot. <laughs> um, but it's also good to have other people review your stuff before you start doing it. So that's that, that will be helpful, too. And even having people of that age group to give you feedback. But when you're rushing like me, trying to get something out, it might slip through the cracks on that one. Uh, so I talk about hair bullying. So I have an anti-hair bullying pledge. So if you hear anybody else talk about it, tell them first you heard it from me. Yep, you heard it right. So the anti-hair bully pledge is where we tell kids not to tease people by the way they wear their hair, regardless of how they wear their hair. We told them that. And so we kind of repeat that, go over it, and I leave it so they can sign it. And a witness is one of their friends or someone at the table like yourself so that they'll know not to tease people. Okay. That's it. Next. I also do what I call LOLs, and LOLs are learning out loud. So that simply means that I have questions. And so I will ask, what are the questions? So when I first did the book, I did not have the questions in there. The books have been redone, and so they actually do come with the question. But what is also unique about the second version of the book is I wanted to hide combs in there, but because the way the illustrator had done it, I was not able to lift the combs off, so we hid brushes. And so I tell them to brush through. And if you ever do the book, I actually tell people to wait till the end because guess what? Kids will be looking for the brushes and won't be paying attention to the stir. So they get to go back and find the brush in different places in the book. And that's what I have for you today. If there's any questions or answers. If you have any questions, I will take any questions. Um, okay. I, I thought that that dread, dreadlocks <clears throat> were, <laughs> were invented by <laughs> the, the um, Jamaicans to protest for, for, prote for protest reasons. Not for negative reasons, for, but for protest reasons. Right. It's the word dread. It comes from dreaded. And so that's, and so your hair is actually locked. And so they just wanted to have a more positive connotation because there was a lot of negative connotation around dread. Like, for example, okay, people would say, do you wash your hair? Do you have, you know, all those kinds of, but you're right. It was a political statement. It was, but also people had already been wearing their hair in the lock style. Because for the most part, if black people just let their hair grow, don't do whatever, it's gonna lock, it's gonna naturally lock. I won't say for everyone, but for the most part with the type of hair that you have. Did you have a comment you wanted to make? Because when I said dread you look like you're like, yeah. Um, you said something about New Orleans earlier. Uh -huh. uh, I just thought it was interesting. You said something about negative connotations, but uh, voodoo. I'm actually a direct descendant of Marie Catherine LeBeau, so that is really close to me. Like, people make fun of it all the time when I go home, and they'd be like, voodoo is this, voodoo is that, I don't even know the voodoo is. Mm -hmm. So I understand that. Mm -hmm. I really do. 
Yeah, and I think that once again, the um, looking at religion and the different things that obviously come with that, but there are articles and different things I want to bring it back to like hair, that people had myth. Like there's still a myth. I, was, I don't necessarily know, I guess it's a myth, but like how old does a young male have to be before they can get their hair cut? Because they say if you cut it before, it would mess up their speech. So a lot of the young people, <laughs> they cut their hair before they tell them, say, well, you're going to have problems. And so is that a myth or is that true? It's a myth. But it's carried, some myths are carried so deeply and believed so that, it, you know, it's almost like does it have some validity to it? Because when that happens, it's like, didn't I tell you your grandmother, big mama would say not to cut their hair? And so, and there are a lot of barbers really will challenge people on saying, I'm not going to cut their hair. How old is it? So you will be, you know, so that's there. Um, I know, I don't, I think there's truth to this and health around it. Like when a, um, a person would have a child and they would say, you're not to wash your hair for what is it? Six weeks, six days. So my sister, <laughs> Let's review and record. But anyway, my mom went to visit and she didn't want her to do a hair. And it was like, oh, I'm going to have to try to do something to my hair. Guess what? She didn't feel well. So, because it says it opened up your pores, it does. So that's why sometimes these myths can be so heavily embedded. For me, coming from that culture, I wonder, like, they might have had wisdom about it. So I just kind of like, okay. There's something to be said about, you know, different myths. Okay. As a person who uh, grew up in Alabama, um, what I will say on your comment about myths, you know, I want to push back a little. Mm -hmm. I think what happened is that science did not come to our communities and do research. And as we fast forward now, a lot of things that my grandparents used to say, like that chemical cannot be good for both hair. Mm -hmm. and, they, and they would never do that. So a lot of things that we know intuitively, or they are taking all of these old wise cures that people got bark and put all this medicine together. Now they are mimicking that in labs. So what I will say that if we had had scientists, more scientists in our community, and people to take it more serious, we would have had more millionaires. So I think that because people kept those cultures and a lot of them were culture and they had reason, but they didn't pass it on and write it down so we could understand why. That's an excellent point uh, when signs meet black hair because now it's like with the, you know, people in the cancer and the different things that actually comes with that. So. Yeah, five bullets and all of that. Five bullets, okay. And my mom will probably say, see, I told you. <laughs> I want to say this too. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say yes, I enjoyed the presentation and I just want to just sort of add to that little myth. My mom used to tell us all the time, if uh, you comb your hair, be sure you wrap it up tight and put it in the garbage can. If you put it outside, the bird's going to get it, you're going to get a headache. And you know, we all got a kiss. And go, oh yeah, I did. I did. I got a headache. It was just the weirdest thing. Or if you wash your hair before a certain time, you're going to fall ill. And I actually fell ill. And so I believe it. Uh, we come from a family of natural hair. So what we did do, we press hair. And it's a joke now. But when I went to, oh, my mom also has a Madam CJ, Madam CJ Walker, everybody. We have an authentic Madam, Madam CJ Walker pressing comb that mom still has. And she gave it to me because I pressed. Don't let it. <laughs> but it's okay. But my point is a lot of the times, we, uh, we buy into things because sometimes we have hair, like you say, do different things like it. Okay, example, if I left mine alone and didn't even wear it naturally, it'll just, it's no style to it. It's just, uh, I can make it pretty like her. It's just, it does something, it's crazy. So you press it. And just yesterday I went about my blue magic. Don't laugh. Because they were out of ultra sheen, satin cream press. <laughs> you know what I mean? Seriously, and I have it in my office right now. I don't show it to people because they lay. You what? You know, but anyway, it's beautiful about our hair, and um, it's what makes us unique. 
We're a mixture of everything. And our hair is a mixture of everything going all the way back historically. So I just want to say it's, it's beautiful the way you're bringing this to the forefront about our African-American hair, our heritage and our beauty. Thank you. Thank you so much for the, com <laughs> the comments. I do want to say that Blue Magic Grease also Blue come Magic. in green. Green, yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> so there's other elements to uh, the Blue Magic Grease. And I know. I, a, a I think I can talk louder enough. Okay. In, in your education process, how do you integrate parents' lack of understanding and knowledge that? They are passing on to their babies mm -hmm. about quote unquote good hair mm -hmm. and getting all of this drama mm -hmm. down at three and four years old, so they look quote unquote pretty. Mm -hmm. Is there a an opportunity for you to address parents? Because you can tell the kids all that, and they go to school and they learn to take care and all that, and then they go home and then they get these words. That Excellent question. Um, I would say through mediums like this, or if I'm invited out, but I just never had like a get together and say all the parents kind of rally together and talk to them. But that's a great opportunity to do that uh, because I was just starting at that point of wanting them to celebrate. But you're exactly right because a lot of the parents are doing their hair. And we've seen a lot of children being expelled and different things from school because they have like a dress code and things like that. So excellent point. Thank you for bringing me. Any other comments or questions? I so no, you know you carry this message to the classroom, to the little children. I want to ask you, have you had any personal testimonies from them as to having been bullied and how, they help, how they've handled it? Oh, absolutely. A lot of times when I am in the classroom, like I went to one alternative school and the young lady said that she came to class, that came to school with a cap on. You're not to wear a cap to school, but her mother could not afford to get her hair done. So people were making fun of her because of that. So I do, uh, there was an older group, so I do allow them to kind of share about their, you know, experience with their, you know, with their hair. Um, sometimes the younger kids is more like comical, like they'll say things like, I was doing something, one of my braids fell off. You know, so they will, it's more like a comic. But I also know that we as African Americans use a sense of humor sometimes to cover up our pain. Because so so we can't kind of talk about, well, you know, I know I noticed that you're laughing now, but how did you really feel? Did you get to, and so that kind of opens it up a little bit. So yes. I know you. Okay. Uh, I, I just wanted to uh, <clears throat> tell you something. Okay. Uh, <laughs> See, I'm half white and half black, half mm -hmm. black and half white. And my, oh, half, I'm half black and half white. And, oh, okay. and, and see, my mother was white and my father was black. My father in the 50s got a process. Uh, and, Admi he admitted that he got the process so he could be accepted. Mm -hmm. He got a job at Universal Studios that he kept for 30 years because of the, because of his, because, because his hair. Is. A process, a process is a perm. It's not a perm. Uh, it, it, they, they used to do some stuff called cock. Mm -hmm. Cock that's, mm -hmm. that's, uh, anyway. Um, uh, and, and, and see, he had to, because he was accepted better with his straight hair, he got the mindset that black hair, pinky hair, he called it pinky, that black hair was bad. So when I was little, I had this curly hair, you know, because I was half black, half white, and it was curly, it was in the middle, you know, and, and so he thought, okay, your hair is all right. When I started, but, but the but I started letting my hair grow out. And the longer my hair grows out, the bushier it gets. So I, I, I when uh, afros came along, I had the best, biggest afro in the world. And my father felt like it was kinky and it was negative as a whole shot, you know. Uh, you know, I just, 
I just wanted to share that experience. And my mother at the same time agreed with him, you know. But then when I did get the Afro, she thought it was beautiful. So she changed, she changed her mind and, and um, she accepted black hair before he did. He's from Mississippi, okay. uh, Jackson, Mississippi. Did you keep it up? Oh. Did you keep it up? The Afro? The Afro? Yeah, I kept it for a year. I kept it for like 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then I got a, then I got a uh, what do you call it? I mean, uh, what do you call those things? Chair, chair, chair. Thank you for sharing, but what you were talking about is we live within a culture, we live within systems. So if the system say that to wear your hair like this means you are, you know, something, whatever that might mean, uh, ugly, or maybe you don't have good hair, then most people, when they would see me immediately, their mindset would be, well, she must not have good, what they consider to be good hair. So she cut her hair off. And so within those systems, in order for me to make you feel as if you're not worthy, because anything that was black was considered to be negative. So your hair was negative, the way you talk, the way you walk, the way you dress, everything about you, because I want you to become a part of this culture that says it's right. I even grew up to a nursery rhyme that said, if you're white, you're all right. If you're black, get back. If you're brown, stick around. And so you know how that goes. So anything in that time, so when people began, they call it the Andrew Davis kind of movement, was they was going back to their roots, so to speak. So that's why it's kind of like a play on words, going back to your roots to say that you are okay. So you can see the young people now who they think they're doing something that's different, they're back there natural, they're doing it, and they're actually going back to traditional things to say this is so... Thank you so much for sharing that story. I really, truly appreciate it. And we'll take this and you sure? In the Baptist church, they say, all hearts and minds are clear. <laughs> I don't think your heart and mind is clear, young lady. So we want to use it. OK. <laughs> Right, let's give Dr. Holloway a huge, huge round of applause. That was an amazing and rich dialogue, and we need that. We need that connection with one another. Thank you so much. Um, before you leave today, we want to know more about you. We want to know what you think, what makes you tick. We have an evaluation that's going around the room, so please take a moment and complete that. It will only make us better. We greatly appreciate it. At this time, also, there's someone very important I would also like to recognize, and that is Dr. Joan Fobbs. Dr. Fobbs, I know you're going to hate this, but I want you to stand up. Dr. Fobbs is a museum volunteer, and she has been instrumental in, uh, in organizing our, lunch, our Brown Bag Lunch Lecture Series. So thank you, Dr. Fobbs. Please give her a, a hand. She is a local community volunteer who showed up on my doorstep one day and I said, come here, I love you, come on, we need you. And she has been fabulous, thank you. Um, let's do some door prizes. Everybody's got a ticket at their table. Where are the... Um, we, need, we need another one here. And Dr. Holloway, I would like for you to draw our door prizes for us. It must be off, is it not making... It's coming and going, evidently. Can you hear me now? Oh, I'll bring it to you. Okay. So get your tickets out. How many door prizes is it? We've got four. Yeah, four, four door, door prizes. prizes. Let me tell you what the trick is to these door prizes. If you win a door prize, I want you to make sure you're listening. They all go to me. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna give the numbers to you so you can see. Okay. That's fine. I did that too. Now, now I'm nervous. <laughs> oh, I got the place. Oh, 
put them in there and check it out. <laughs> okay, we're drawing for our first door prize. Okay, drum roll. Come on, y'all. Good job, good job. Okay, first. Go with the last number. 85, 85, 185. There it is. Woo! Numbers are 16, 19. Did y'all wow. see that? Wow. Sounds like another. <laughs> sounds like another talk. Is it? They're supposed to be. Yeah. Uh, ninety two hundred. Is that nine nine uh, nine two hundred? Two hundred. That's supposed to be when the first lady Right here. Oh. John? They have a project called the 1619 project, but they believe there were ships before then. Two eleven, two one one, two one one. Okay, we got one more, or this is one more. Okay, one more, one more. One more. The lady in the pink. <laughs> So gorgeous. 207. 207. Let's In the back way. Woo! Let's do that, guys. Good job. Good job. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Holloway. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Be sure to complete. Um, a, a, uh, an evaluation form. And please join us again next month. October the 5th, I believe it is, at noon, we'll have another lunch lecture. Bring your lunch and join in the fun. Joan, did you have something you wanted to do? Yes, we want to get, if you want to get on our mailing list or give us your email so that you can be kept abreast of upcoming events and the eviction newsletter, please fill that information out on this sheet. We have lots of cookies and water. Help yourself as much of that as you like. And you can just, you can leave them laying on the table. That's fine. We'll pick them up. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Nice turn.